Hello, friends. Welcome back. Um, Dr. Martinez here, Dr. Angie Martinez. I'm here to give a talk which I've entitled, uh, Let's Face It. Um, let me get this mic right. I've entitled it, Miss Let's Face It, for a couple of reasons. First of all, um, in the next two to three weeks, depending on our leadership, uh, we may find ourselves leaving our homes as they relax the uh, isolation um, and quarantine recommendations. And so I've had a few patients call me and ask about that with some concern. They happen to be patients with, who are vulnerable and high risk to the, an inf these particular infections. But we discussed what we needed to do about that. And so as we're anticipating uh, leaving our quarantine uh, safe places, uh, unfortunately the reality is, is that we're going to be exposed again just like China, who's been released from quarantine, um, they started seeing the infectious rates start uh, to start up on the rise again. And so that's sort of what to, is what to be expected. And so if we're going out there, we, we have time now to prepare ourselves. And so what does that mean if we're going to face it? So let's face it, we're going to run into virus at some point as we leave our homes. And let's face it, it takes a good, healthy immune response. And so if you followed me, I've, I've covered what that entails. This basically is the part of our innate immune system that really isn't addressed in our conventional model of care. But in this uh, paradigm of looking at the innate immune system, we actually address uh, opportunities to help ourselves uh, as, as we try and protect our bodies. And that's through the, the barriers that this uh, virus is going to encounter initially. And so this was a picture did, um, of our barriers. This, for example, is in our nasal passage or in our lungs. And if you followed my previous talks, I explained what that barrier uh, was, um, what represented that barrier. And the first part of that barrier was the bacteria. And I talked about how we need bacteria to help protect us from viral infections. Um, the second layer within that mucosal layer is some immunoglobulins, such, such as secretory IgA. It's a type of protein that actually has some immune, immune properties that helps protect us. And then the mucosa surface just physically and of itself has, has uh, ability to protect us from a virus that's trying to make its way uh, into our bodies. The next layer is this epithelial cell, which basically is tightly held together to help protect us. And then the last important layer is the T regulatory cells. And these are the ones that are actually going to step up and help protect us um, if there's any intrusion. And all this together acts like a moat around a castle. Back um, in those castle days, um, they had a body of water surrounding the castle. And the whole purpose of that body of water was to s help decrease or at least slow down the intrusion of any enemy. And it allowed time for the knights or whoever was w inside defending the castle to gather forces to help protect the king or the queen or the inhabitants of the castle. So the moat was a way to help slow that down. That's exactly what this barrier is acting like. It's a way to slow down the intrusion. And if by some chance a virus is able to make it through, information is actually communicated down to the t reg cells from our bacteria, from the mucus components of the mucus layer, there's a form of communication that tells this t reg cell basically that we're under fire, we're under siege, hurry, help us out. And so these t regs when they're healthy, can come up and put up a strong defense for us. And the combination of these layers actually can prevent or at least protect us from a lot of intrusion, um, any type of virus, the flu, cold viruses, and, and potentially the coronavirus. This basically is a concept in functional medicine that helps us understand the importance of a good, healthy immune response. And a healthy immune response um, incorporates two components. So there's two arms to our immune system. There's the important part of defense and uh, defen defending us. And the other component is actually heal and repair. Now, I've talked a whole bunch about defending us as regards to holding a f a f a resistance against an intruding virus, but I haven't talked much about our immune system, how it now needs to kick in uh, repair 
and I'm going to just bring that up in terms of what's up, or at least what's new information that we're sort of finding out with the uh, coronavirus. But if this all works, then we have a good robust immune response, and then we may not have too many symptoms if we we're ever exposed to the coronavirus. Problem is, is those folks who have uh, complex infections who end up in the hospital, they're the folks who don't have very good bacteria, they don't have very good immune responses, they don't have good mucus layers. Maybe we talked about actually the problem, a special issue with uh, ACE receptors for high-risk patients. This ACE receptor at this level allows the virus to come on in. It's sort of a doorway. And there's certain conditions that have high uh, amounts of ACE receptors like diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease, and obesity. And we found those have been risk factors because of this special component that the virus takes advantage of. And then not having good Treg response. So if we don't have a very good immune response, then it's it sets us up for vulnerability for these types of infections. And so that's what we see, who's getting the coronavirus, who's actually having complex reactions. <coughs> and as I explained in the past, as the virus makes its way past this point, and the virus has actually made its way into the castle, the problem is, is that it stimulates our immune system in a very hyperactive way and this is the prop this is where we end up with problems. This is where we end up needing intubation. Here's where we can't um, diffuse oxygen to our bodies. This is where we're having uh, significant problems that require hospitalization. And so this is actually in the acute setting when you find yourself in the hospital. But lately, as we follow people who actually survive that acute response, they go to the hospital, they get intubated, and then they get out and leave. Those who they followed, they found that they still continue to have lingering problems in the sense of persistent symptoms, in the sense of persistent tests that are positive, but often on fever, significant fatigue. Um, so there's a lot of problems that people have, you know, in this subacute time frame. And there has definitely been some component of even chronic problems or new chronic problems such as heart disease, meaning that this virus actually has had some direct effect on some uh, persistent chronic problems, aside from just having the acute immune um, uh, challenges that it, it gives us. And so these chronic problems that people are running into are a problem of not being able to repair and heal, not being able to put the brakes, not being able to pick up and clean up. And so this is going to be another issue we're going to have to deal with down the road to figure out what those what those outcomes are going to be, or what are those um, challenges for people who've had significant complex uh, infections, and so the immune system is part of that, and that's and that's the point about this picture, saying okay, if you have problems with your immune system, we have problems defending, then we actually have problems getting over this. So um, it does there is an importance to at least now. Um, proactively trying to boost up our immune systems um, so we can keep this in balance and, and do the best that we can to fend off. So part of let's face it is when we're actually in front of a virus, we, you know, it does take good health um, to protect us. So that's, that's part of the let's face it reality. So what do we do in the next two to three weeks before we're out, left out to go face this? Um, there's a couple things we can do to get our immune system on track, and it actually doesn't take very long. It, two, three weeks, is, um, and with some uh, significant changes and lifestyle changes, you can actually do some good to your immune system. So the first thing I want to focus in on, and I've mentioned a, a few of these in the past, is things that we want to avoid that are bad for our immune system. And I call them the bads, um, because they're all um, start with the letter S. So the first bad that we need to stay away from is sugar. Too much sugar basically affects the, the health of the mucosal layer. It changes the bacteria and actually um, will decrease the amount of functional mucosal layer. On average, Americans eat about 57 pounds of uh, sugar per year, and so too much. And so if we do want to do anything 
um, positive to help our mucus uh, health in the next two to three weeks, we should decrease our sugar intake. And this is especially, we don't realize, we're just getting this in a lot of our drinks. It's actually the juices, you know, the coffee shop runs that we have with all the lattes are full of sugar. Those are, that's usually the hidden places of all the sugars that we're getting. Second thing that we uh, want to control or decrease is stress. Um, hard to say that because this is a tough time and everybody um, has a s particular, everybody has that some layer of stress. Um, prior to COVID, when they've done uh, studies, they found that 77% of people have a significant amount, a level of stress that would affect their health or their mental health over a year. And that was before the uh, COVID um, series. And so you can imagine there's a lot more stress than 70%. And so the other prob the problem with the stress is stress increases cortisol, which is a hormone, a stress hormone, and that cortisol will actually damage the mucus layer and the gut lining. The next S is sleep. Sleep, you know, we've compromised sleep on average. We might sleep 6.5 hours a night, and we actually need at least seven to nine hours, depending on our age. Kids need more. But the problem is, is that, uh, well, the importance of sleep, I should mention, is um, sleep actually supports Tregs. And so it's during the time that we're sleeping that our body is actually cleaning out the old, weak Tregs and putting in new, healthy T regulatory cells. And so we really do need that time to sleep. The next S is sucky foods. On average, people are eating out four to five times a week, and that's usually the fast, convenient, cheap foods, which typically are poor nutrition. And um, when you don't have good nutrition, you can't support strong health. To hold this mucus layer, to hold this gut line, or the, the respiratory lining, lung lining, or gut lining, to keep your immune system strong, that takes a lot of energy in the form of food. And so if we aren't uh, focusing on healthy foods, then we're compromising ourselves uh, in terms of our immune health. Smoking, I don't have to convince you that smoking probably damages the lungs that are actually putting people at risk for COVID, especially if you think about maybe the SACE receptor being uh, elevated in those that have damage to their lungs. Um, and that smoking is not only tobacco, it's any other product that you smoke. It could be marijuana, it could be vaping, um, all those are damaging that lung lining and the respiratory lining that puts you at risk and at least, if anything, damages the lining. And last in the S's is shots. And what I mean by that is shots of alcohol. Even though I like a good margarita, this is the time I'm actually um, backing off of alcohol, mostly because alcohol is directly damaging to the mucus layer. And so um, this is the time, even though we have time and we have lots of stress, it might feel like a good glass of wine at the end of the day is helpful, but at least when we're thinking about prevention of, uh, or at least maintaining a good healthy mucosa lining, alcohol actually is gonna compromise that. And so those are the bad things we just want to avoid that are just compromising our good health in terms of the uh, immune health. What are the good things we can do for that? Fermented foods, not a very common thing that we've eaten and not a very common food type that we've eaten in uh, our culture. Back historically, people lived off fermented foods because they didn't have very good refrigeration. And the refrigeration, um, um, and because they had more fermented foods, they were able to help support their immune system. Because we have a refrigerated society, we eat less fermented foods, and so we've lost our taste for that, those types of foods. And um, now's a good time to start thinking about going back to that. Veggies are your better options for fermented foods. You can also have kombucha drinks. A point on fermented foods is that yogurt, um, when you buy it at the grocery store, has it's been pasteurized, so there's not a lot of good bacteria in that. And that's the whole purpose of fermented food, is supporting the bacteria. The next important food is fiber, and this is yet another thing we've forgotten in our society. 
And when I'm talking about fiber, I'm talking about roughage, the type of fiber that our body doesn't break down very well, but our bacteria will. And that's the whole point about this fi fiber. It's not necessarily for our health. It's actually to help the bacteria. When the bacteria eat the fiber, it, it's basically food for the bacteria. But the other part is that it has um, a gel-like structure or character to it that basically contributes to the architecture of the mucus layer. So if you can imagine putting chia seeds in almond milk and sit it in the refrigerator overnight in that morning, that gelatinous uh, um, gel-like consistency, that's exactly what we're trying to get from this type of fiber, that gel-like consistency so that it can contribute to supporting this mucosa layer where our bacteria can sit and get protected, the good bacteria, and then it can also add food for the bacteria. Next important thing to focus in on eating is good protein. Protein typically isn't difficult for us to get in, as, um, but the problem is, is getting good protein and good quality protein is what matters. And unfortunately, if we're eating out frequently, that protein sources that we're eating um, is, is significantly compromised. It's usually processed types of protein. So we need to focus in on getting, getting good quality protein. The protein, the importance of the protein is it's actually helping keeping these junctures together, these tight junctions tightly to together. It also contributes to the peptides that are supporting our immune system in that mucosa lining. And so whether it's plant protein or animal protein, be sure to get good quality proteins. And the last but not least, what I, I call mushrooms and rainbows. So mushrooms and rainbows, there's something magical about mushrooms and rainbows when it comes to health. So first of all, mushrooms, I, typic I technically mean directly mushrooms in terms of food. Historically, um, mushrooms are a different type of plant and the protein structures and, and um, the phytonutrient components of the proteins actually contribute to a little bit of magic in terms of our immune system. And it basically supports, it has certain proteins that really directly support the immune system. And there's pl plenty of studies and, and um, old ways of dealing with immune health that people have used for ages, and that those included mushrooms. And so mushrooms of any kind, eating them, mushrooms and powders, and, and putting them in shakes, all those ways, those are very good to help with our immune system. And last but not least, what I mean by rainbows, a rainbow type of diet is basically getting the rainbow colored of your fruits and vegetables. On average, people are only eating um, two to three servings of fruits and vegetables total per day. Um, and actually, that d should be closer to seven to nine servings a day. And the color of the vegetable or the color of the fruit is what's most important. Color is an energy, and that's Mother Nature's way of healing. And so when I'm talking about healing in terms of our immune system, those colors add certain phytonutrients that our bacteria respond to. But the other part about this, there's a certain energy to help our immune system through our mitochondria. Um, and having a lots of energy through different colored veggies and fruits actually support that process of healing. And so Let's face it, it really does take a lot of support for our immune system in terms of quality, quality of food and quality lifestyle. The mucus la layer is pretty responsive to what we do, and so if we change our life in the next two to three weeks, we can do so much to sort of face the fact that we're gonna run into this virus if we haven't done so already, and we can actually have things that are gonna help put resistance so that we can be the person who doesn't end up in this situation because we still don't know so much about this situation. But we do know, at least in the functional world, that we can do some things. We can do some things in a short period of time to sort of support us through that. And so what I'm gonna do differently now in closing now is challenge you now that you have this information. If you want, I'm gonna give you information to sign up for an email. And if you sign up for an email, I'll send you a little challenge sheet and it basically is um, a sheet that shows us all the different colors of our veggies and our fruits. 
And what it is, it's like a bingo card. You get to mark it out for those types of colors that you've eaten throughout the week. And I would say maybe in the next week, work on getting this bingo card filled up. And I'll be able, I'll send you that information so that you can have um, information summarizing what I talked about as well as access to this little sheet. The other thing is nice when you use it is it actually helps teach your the kids, uh, help teach kids what's important for our health. Um, and it, you can make it a game, you know, going uh, having people choose what they want, having the family choose what they want to eat from a color standpoint. But the goal is, is at least in the next two to three weeks, start getting colors on board and see if you can get every color. And um, the whole point about that is it'll help support your health, a healthier immune system. When you finish it, if you feel accomplished and that's really important for you to share, please share with me. If you send me your information through an email, um, you know, just say, I've, Dr. Martinez, I've completed that. Or if you want to send me a picture of your, your checked off charts, I'll send you additional information on other specific things you can do to help challenge you to the next level. So just a little fun game. If you want, give me your email and I'll send this stuff to you. Um, but until then, you know, let's face it, we're in this together. And it's going to take a lot of good immune health to finally get to that herd immunity that really, really do need to stop this virus. So if you like more of that, please feel free to give me feedback. Um, and I'm continually trying to make things uh, work so that I can um, engage and do different activities so that you learn, have the opportunity to learn more because um, knowledge is, is uh, what's going to get us through this. Thanks for your time again. And uh, take care of you.